Hello, I'm Jeffrey Mishlove, you know. <laughs> I woke up this morning and I thought to myself, oh my gosh, today is the first day out of 118 days that I will not be launching one of my in-presence monologues because I just didn't have time to do one yesterday. So, uh, as of 3 a.m. Uh, mountain time, when they normally get launched, nothing was released. But then I thought to myself, wait, I can do this. I can make this happen today. I don't have to stop my long run of uh, <laughs> 119 days in a row. So, here I am. <laughs> And I guess it has something to do with my belief in the goodness of what is happening here with these monologues. I'm getting great feedback from many of you. <laughs> I'm getting some interesting feedback from many of you. And I'm happy to be here. Let me say that. And I do believe in what I'm doing. Something good is happening here. <laughs> on many levels. But I thought I'd talk a little bit about belief because uh, it's in some ways it's a dirty word. You know, William James wrote this essay on the will to believe. I think it was one of his Gifford lectures that uh, he gave at the University of Edinburgh on the uh, philosophy of religion and the immortality of the soul. But what he had to argue was that it's okay to believe because in his day, there were very vociferous academics who were saying it is a sin to believe in something without adequate evidence. It is an intellectual sin. If you don't have evidence for something, just admit you don't know. And, you know, there's a lot of merit to that argument. <laughs> there really is. I would say I, I subscribe to that argument more than I do not subscribe to it. And I can speak, I think, in behalf of the community of people working in the field of parapsychology. They subscribe to it, too. Parapsychologists are, by and large, committed to the scientific method. That means that they're looking for evidence to support theories and hypotheses related to the existence of psychic functioning. It's not a matter of belief for these researchers who pay enormous attention to the fine points of methodology. But to the skeptics, and, and they're not real skeptics, as I've pointed out many times, to the scoffers, who don't want to acknowledge that there's any possibility of uh, paranormal phenomena, what we call paranormal, it's, who, as far as I can tell, it's so widely distributed in the population that it's really quite normal. But it's called paranormal because given the uh, paradigm of the Western materialist mindset, it's almost impossible to explain. How can we know the future when the future hasn't happened, for example? How can we know about uh, the details of events that take place far, far away from any sensory input that could come to us? It seems illogical. It seems as if it doesn't make sense. And yes, it doesn't make sense in terms of the normal senses. So, there's a uh, tradition in philosophy that uh, you just don't believe in these things. But there's an irony because I think that tradition largely goes back to a, a, an authentic skeptical philosopher, David Hume, who was a uh, 17th or 18th century empiricist in the British tradition, a Scottish philosopher. And he wrote that if anybody claims that they have witnessed the miraculous, it's safe to just disbelieve them because miracles don't happen. It's much safer to disbelieve them than to accept them. In fact, he, he would say you just, you know, miracles don't happen. That's sort of the bedrock of his whole philosophy. So, people who uh, consider themselves, I think sometimes they're called naturalistic philosophers, they, they would say that anyone who purports to believe in 
miracles, meaning what we call the paranormal or extrasensory perception, telepathy, precognition, clairvoyance, and psychokinesis, reincarnation, and life after death, all of those things are just ruled out automatically. You don't even have to bother with the empirical evidence, with the fine points of methodology. They are impossible. We can discount them because we are naturalists. The universe is based on natural law. The universe is based on rational principles and anything, any other claims to the contrary, you can be safely ignored. Now, the irony here is that David Hume was a regular churchgoer. In spite of his skepticism, he found it prudent to attend, I think it was the Scottish Presbyterian Church, every Sunday. Now, William James, in his essay on the will to believe, took issue with these people who who said that, you know, belief in things for which you have no evidence is an intellectual sin. And William James argued uh, along many different lines here. And in fact, he also challenged the so-called Pascal's wager. Blaise Pascal, a 17th century French philosopher, said, life is a wager. We are wagering our life, our immortal soul, on whether or not God exists. If we claim that God doesn't exist and we're correct, no problem. If we claim God does exist and we're wrong, well, there's no fault really, so when we die, we'll be dead. But if we claim God doesn't exist and then God does exist, we may be doomed to eternal damnation. Therefore, the safest bet is the bet that God exists. So we should show up in church. (laughs) And in that case in France, it was the Catholic Church. It was the Mass. It was the rituals of the Catholic Church. And William James pointed out that that argument would seem pretty silly to somebody who wasn't a Catholic, for whom the option of becoming a devout Catholic wasn't even in the card, say if you're born a Hindu or a Muslim. But James argued further that the idea of believing in God in order to win a wager and save your soul from eternal damnation wasn't very good motivation in any case. But he did argue that believing in religion in in this case could be a very positive thing. He said, it's like, suppose you have a friend and you want to know, does my friend like me? Well, won't it be the case that your friend is going to like you more if you like him back? If you think about your friend, if you do things for your friend, if you're a good friend to your friend, your friend might like you more. But if you completely ignore your friend, if you act as if your friend doesn't even exist, why should your friend like you? And he seemed to be suggesting that we have the power of entering into a personal relationship with the divine. And of course, many religious traditions say as much. And that it's okay to have that belief. It's a good thing to have that belief if it helps you enter into that kind of a relationship. And I think James, as a pragmatist, would say, if your life is working better because of that relationship, because I think it's fair to say that there are all kinds of people out there who believe that they're having an intimate relationship with God and that that could be harmful for them. I mean, for example, there are people who commit crimes in the name of God, including murder. So, I think James has a point. Uh, I don't really wholeheartedly agree because it seems to me, first of all, God doesn't care that much (laughs) about whether you believe in God. And I'm thinking back to my own experiences because I've had an intimate relationship. I think of it as maybe with the universe, with the consciousness of the universe. I've been guided by dreams and synchronicities throughout my life. I've been open to them. I've been willing to believe in the possibility that my psyche, my consciousness can do these things. I believe in myself 
in that regard. And in parapsychology, we have a whole set of research known as the sheep-goat effect. It basically says that people who believe that they can do ESP perform better than people who believe that they can't on tests of ESP. It's that simple. So, belief does play a role. I want to conclude with one thought from my mentor, Arthur M. Young, the inventor of the Bell helicopter. He once said to me, belief is like the flywheel of an engine. You know, uh, a flywheel is, is basically, it stores rotational energy. It spins around. Now, the engine doesn't have constant rotational energy because you take your foot on and off the gas. When you put your foot on the gas, vroom, but if your foot isn't on the gas, the engine would slow down. But the flywheel is what keeps that rotational energy going. It keeps your engine going. And Arthur Young said, belief works just like that. It keeps you going. When you're not getting power from any other source, it's your belief that keeps you moving forward. So, I would say this, belief serves a positive psychological function, or let me put it even a little more conservatively, belief can serve a positive psychological function. But frankly, I'm willing to concede, along with all of those intellectual skeptics, that oftentimes a great deal of harm occurs when belief is misplaced. And I think you would all agree with me about that. So, the thought, the question I'll leave you with then today is this, what do you believe in? What do you believe in? What are your core beliefs? And are there any of your core beliefs that you would be willing to let go of? Is there anything that maybe you believe in a little too much? I'll leave you with that thought. And thank you. Thank you for being with me.